Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Money Girl Podcast. My name is Laura Adams. I'm a personal finance expert and author based in Austin, Texas. On this show, my mission is to help you master your money so you can live rich and love the journey. Each episode is like a mini training created to go deeper into a specific topic with key information that you need to be more financially aware, to stay motivated to improve your financial health, and to make better money decisions. Thanks so much for downloading the show and to everyone who submitted reviews and ratings in iTunes. That helps the podcast get visibility so new listeners can find it and I can help more people get the financial information they need. So if you're getting value from the show and you have not done a rating or review yet, that's the best way to give back and let me know. So please take a moment to submit a quick five-star review in iTunes. It would mean so much to me. I'll thank you in advance for that. Today's topic isn't the most exciting one, in my opinion, but it's a really important one. I'm definitely not trying to turn you guys into CPAs or accountants by covering the taxes topic, but I want you to have a basic understanding of the essentials. If you have taxes automatically deducted from your paycheck and you don't itemize them in a financial system like Quicken, you may not realize that taxes are likely your largest expense. They take a huge bite out of our income. So you're probably shelling out more in taxes than you are for housing. And because we're paying so much, it's really important to to do what we can to pay as little as possible legally and stay on top of the rules. I believe our tax system is way more complex than it needs to be. However, it is what it is. So our job is to do everything we can to pay as little as possible within the legal guidelines and comply with the law so we stay out of trouble. In this podcast, I'm going to explain a tax document that you may receive at the beginning of the year called a 1099 form. You'll learn who gets them, who issues them, what to do with one, and how to handle a missing 1099. And I'll wrap up with eight key things you should know about taxable income. The show notes, which include resources and previous podcasts that I may mention, are always on the Money Girl section at quickanddirtytips.com. This is show number 488 called What is a 1099 Form? Eight Things to Know About Taxable Income in Plain English. When it comes to paying taxes, the burden of complying with the very complex law falls on your shoulders. So forgetting to file or claiming ignorance about what you owe or don't owe, it's not an excuse. Failing to pay can end up costing you a boatload of back taxes, interest, and penalties if you get audited. And by the way, I was recently involved in a sales tax audit for one of the companies that I own that handles rental property. And because I was really organized and I had everything available to give the IRS, it turned into nothing. So, you know, just because you get audited doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be a bad thing. If you have all your ducks in a row, it can really be pretty painless. So you must report all income from any source within the United States or abroad unless it's legally exempt from taxation. And I want you to be aware that income has a broader definition than just receiving money. Income can also be in the form of property, services, or even a situation where no money changes hands, like a barter. Even if you have an informal side job, like you're a freelancer or an independent contractor that creates income, it's taxable, no matter if you earn $1 or a million dollars each year. So that includes providing services like babysitting, dog walking, computer repair, house cleaning, even if you also have a full-time regular job. However, if your total income is below a certain threshold each year, you're not required to file a tax return. The requirements for having to file taxes depends on three factors, your gross income, your filing status, so like whether you're single or married, and your age. Here's an example. If you're single, you're under the age of 65, and you had total gross income less than $10,350 in 2016, you don't have to file a tax return. If you're married, 
and you file a joint tax return and both spouses are under the age of 65, you don't have to file a return if your household income was less than twice that amount for a single, if it's less than 20700 These filing thresholds can change each year, so you need to stay on top of it if you're listening to this podcast out in the future. So to stay on top of it, you can check out IRS Publication 17 called Your Federal Income Tax for Individuals. And there's also a pretty handy tool that the IRS gives you called Do I Need to File a Tax Return? And I'll put a link to both of those resources in the notes for the show. And just as a side note, Even if your income is below the filing requirement threshold, it's still smart to file an income tax return. Here's why. Let's say you had too much tax withheld from your paycheck or you're entitled to a tax credit. The government does not automatically just pay you a refund or send you a tax credit. The only way to get your money is by filing a tax return. So even if you have very low income, I would encourage you to file a tax return just so you have that information and it's available to the government in case you are owed money back. And to learn more about the types of income that are taxable and non-taxable, refer to IRS Publication 525, but I'll cover the basics in this podcast. So the most common type of taxable income that you're probably already very familiar with is from an employer. Wages and taxes withheld from your paycheck are reported to you and to the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS, each year on a form called the W-2. But as I mentioned, there are other types of income that you may receive in addition to a regular job or besides a regular job that are also taxable. These include, but are not limited to, freelance or side business income, interest income on a savings account or a certificate of deposit or CD, dividends from investments, proceeds from real estate transactions, rent or royalty income, prize or contest winnings, withdrawals from retirement accounts, and cancellation of debts. To keep track of what you earn outside of W-2 income, the IRS created a variety of forms called 1099s. The people or companies who pay you are required to file a 1099 to describe and document what you were paid during the year. For instance, freelancers typically receive a 1099 MISC for miscellaneous income. And the 1099-INT reports interest income from a bank account. Payers are not required to withhold taxes for non-employees. So if you receive 1099 income and you are self-employed, you'll have to pay self-employment taxes based on your federal tax return and the net income from your business. And I've done previous shows on self-employment taxes and going from being an employee to being self-employed. So if that's a topic that's of interest to you, I would encourage you to go to the Money Girl page, go to the search box on the top right, and just enter the word self-employment or self-employment taxes, and you'll see what comes up. Another podcast that may be of interest to you is number 422 called Five Retirement Options When You're Self-Employed. So let's say you get a 1099 in the mail and you're not sure what to do with it. Or you already filed your taxes and then you get a 1099 late in the mail. I'm going to explain what to do. Okay, back to how to handle your 1099 form. If you receive a 1099 form in the mail, Please don't throw it away because you're going to need it to file your tax return. People or companies who pay you more than a minimum amount are supposed to send you a 1099 copy by January 31. For the 1099 miscellaneous, which is probably the most common one, the minimum amount is $600, but it does vary depending on your income and the type of 1099 you receive. However, it's possible that your 1099 copy can get lost in the mail or that you get forgotten by a payer. If you receive any non-employment income, but you don't get a corresponding 1099, you're not off the hook for reporting it to the IRS, even if you were paid less than $600. This is a common misconception that I want to make sure you understand. Even if you do not receive a 1099, 
or you earn less than $600 from a payer, that income is taxable. So don't believe that you can just skate by without reporting it to the IRS. There's no minimum amount that you can exclude from gross income, even if no one person or company paid you less than $600. However, as I mentioned, if your total gross income is low, you may not be required to file taxes. This is so important because it's likely that the IRS has a copy of your 1099, even if you don't. So remember that it's still your responsibility to pay tax on all income you receive that is legally taxable. If you don't receive a 1099 or you get one that you believe has an error, be sure to follow up with the payer and get that straightened out. If you use a free tax program like TurboTax or Credit Karma, it will ask you if you have any 1099 income. Verify that the information on your 1099 is correct and then include the information in the software. Or you can give your 1099 forms to your tax preparer along with all your other documents for the tax year. That's what I do. At the end of the day, you've got to keep good records because you're responsible for paying taxes based on what you were paid. If you underpay, the IRS will probably find out and reach out for their share plus penalties. Here are eight key points that cover the basics about taxable income so you're not blindsided by an unexpected tax bill or a failure to comply notice from the IRS. Number one, some types of income are not taxable. These include child support payments, gifts, inheritances, life insurance proceeds after someone's death, and income from a qualified education scholarship used for tuition and books. So it's good to know there are some types of non-taxable income out there. The second thing to know is that when you pay more than $600 to someone who is not your employee and they're not a corporation, like a house cleaner or a pet sitter, you must issue him or her a 1099 form. Number three, withdrawals from a traditional retirement account are taxed as ordinary income because contributions are made on a pre-tax basis up front. Now, if you have a Roth account, they work in the opposite way because you do pay tax up front on contributions, but you get to withdraw your contributions and earnings as completely tax-free income. Number four, if you get a late 1099 after you file taxes, don't sweat it. What you need to do is file an amended tax return as quickly as possible to make a correction. As I previously mentioned, you're responsible to report all taxable income, even if you don't receive a corresponding W-2 or 1099 form. Number five, Remember to change your address when you move. Change it with all your payers, your employers, the Postal Service, and the IRS so you never miss an important tax document in the mail. Number six, canceled or forgiven debt is considered taxable income. So if you settle an old debt for less than you owe, remember that you typically are going to have to pay tax on the portion that was forgiven or discharged. The company should send you a 1099-C, standing for canceled debt, if you had a settlement with them during the tax year. Number seven, your income forms are matched by the IRS. Every 1099 and W-2 form that the IRS receives from the people who pay you it gets matched with your 1040 tax return by your social security number. So be sure to include an explanation if you disagree with the amount on the form, or perhaps you could not get an error corrected. If the amount you claim on your tax form does not match what payers say they paid you, the IRS is gonna wanna figure out what's going on. And number eight, state income taxes matter too. So if you live in a state that has an income tax, they receive the same information that the feds do. So be sure your state return will match up with your income records. I hope this episode cleared up any confusion you may have had about paying taxes on non-employee income. If you have a money question or dilemma or just want to hang out with me and a thriving community of thousands who are taking their financial game to the next level, join my private Facebook group called Dominate Your Dollars. 
To request your invitation, visit Dominate Your Dollars on Facebook or send me a text message for immediate access right now. Just text DOLLARS, D-O-L-L-A-R-S. Text that word to the number 33444. I'll see you in the group. You can also reach me directly through my contact page at lauradadams.com. While you're there, check out the resources and tools that I recommend for just about every area of your financial life on my tools page. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Courtesy of Money Girl, your guide to a richer life. 